Uh, hello everyone. So welcome to this week's session. Please confirm if you could hear me and see my screen, please. You could just type on the chat. Okay, nice. Thanks so much. So it's really nice getting to meet you again. And sorry for not getting to meet last week. So I will just start with some overview. So the past week, we have more of like been discussing how you could get started with PyTorch, which was really nice seeing the exercises you guys have been doing. First, we looked at manipulating PyTorch tensors and how you could also utilize the PyTorch workflow, which will be very effective in like the upcoming tasks and works you'll be doing in this particular session, which is neural networks and also other uh, other particular, like any work stream you'll be doing working with PyTorch. So it all follows like the same paradigm, but like one or two things might change, but it won't differ much. So having this background, it's very essential, inshallah. And in this particular like session, we'll be dealing with neural networks. So neural networks is very important to almost building almost any intelligence system you will build. So, uh, so I'll just get started with the notebook. Just a reminder, I'll be using this particular notebook by Daniel. And it's like the primary resource for this, uh, like all our sessions. So if maybe you have you are new to this session, so you could just you could always look at it anytime. So today we'll be looking at neural network classification, and I'll just open my collab here. Uh, please remind us to mute our mic, please. Thank you. So, uh. Yes. So in today's session, we'll be looking at neural networks and neural networks are kind of very important and drives like most of the fundamental like AI solutions that you find uh, now existing. So in the last session, we kind of give a brief of how you could distinguish between uh, systems that are like AI systems that are either classification or regression. So as we explained in the previous session, like when you are dealing with a classification system, you are trying to you are trying to distinguish between a number of classes where okay, I think let me just so imagine you have like a machine learning problem in which you have a data set and your data set consists of like your data and you have your target here. So when you try to do classification, so simply you could look at it like having like a number of buckets. You could want to up to n buckets. Yes, up to n buckets. So when you try to do classification, you try to insert like uh your data points into one of these buckets just to distinguish them. So that's majorly classification when you look at it. So there are a number of uh, methods you could do in classification. So just to recap, like we have this notebook, every information is there, you'll go through it, but I'll just try to give you additional information that'll be helpful for you. So when you look at it, there are a number of maybe types of classification. You could have binary classification and you have multi-class classification. So I'll also go over it, then look at what is multi-label classification. So when you, so taking in this, uh, this explanation we made, you have like various buckets and you want to classify your data into that particular bucket. So when you say it's a binary classification, what you are only saying is that you have just two buckets. Let me see binary classification here. You have just two buckets, bucket one, and you have bucket two. So your data points will just will always fall into any of these two buckets, either bucket one or bucket two. That's binary classification. But when you say you have multi-class classification, you could have several buckets. You could have bucket one, bucket two, up to like n number of buckets. It's more than two. So that's where you have uh multi-class classifications. Then lastly, you also have a type of classification which you call multi-label classification. 
in this case, you could say you have bucket one to, let's say bucket N, let's say one, two here. And each example of your data, let's say you have, let's see Y1, Y2, Y3, several like uh, maybe targets. So you could have the output of one target is in several buckets. You could have Y1 in bucket one, bucket two. You could have Y2 here in just bucket one. Then you could have Y3 in bucket three and bucket four. So one good example, I could clear this. So one good example we could see where you could find this is, imagine you are looking at an image Imagine your neural network or any machine learning problem you're looking at has an image and that image, image consists of a number of objects. These objects could be, for instance, just maybe furnitures such as table. You could have like a human being there. You could have like an animal, like a cat or something of that nature. And what you want your neural network to do is to predict items in that particular in that particular image so in those particular items you could have items to do like something of uh, maybe you could say human you could have maybe cat you could have dog you could have maybe table and like the list continues so in this particular case let's say looking at any example of image your neural network would see like this exists, this exists, and uh, maybe there's something, a dog doesn't exist, but a table exists. So here, as you could see, like there are a number of targets. So that's what you have. That's where you have multi-label classification. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to send them, please. So I think that's majorly of the difference. So in, in binary or multi-class classification, there's like one-to-one, -one uh maybe mapping i would okay not one to one so it's like it's like a bit direct so but in multiple multi label classification your target can consist of a number of like plenty discrete values so so i think we've just gone and uh, yes let me just check if there are questions no questions so i'll just start by running the notebooks so please feel free to stop me anytime. So like for this, this is like the PyTorch workflow, which we have gone over it before. So nothing changes still the same way as it is. So, yes. So I think this is also worth explaining. So the architecture of a neural network, but I think before this, it will also make sense a bit to explain what like a neural network is. So. And you have dealt with a number of machine learning problems. So most of them like depends on a different algorithms entirely, but neural network is a bit special in its own sense. Why is this important? This is important because it takes inspiration directly from the brain. So when the initial people are studying artificial intelligence, try attempting to create any or a, an intelligence system, so they kind of found out why not let's take inspiration from the brain. So when taking inspiration from the brain, uh, yeah, so you could see like your brain has neurons and those neurons kind of connect to each other. And they have this saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. So that's where like the inspiration of creating neural network uh, came along. So you could, a very simple, I will draw like a very simple neural network. Then from there, I will explain what an architecture really means from that uh, maybe drawing. So imagine you have this set of maybe small neuron or several neuron, and they are a bit of like connected to one another. So the connections can be a bit complex, but I'll just make it as simple as possible just so that you could get the gist. So what does it mean for your, what does it mean to have like an architecture of a neural network? 
So an example you could think about is, is like a house. When you have a house, it performs maybe same function for everyone. You live in your house and it gives it gives you a space, a safe space. So when you say a neural net architecture, it just talks about the structure of your neural network. So when you look at houses, every house has a its own particular structure. So, so it has an entirely uh, it has own particular structure, and maybe does the same function in general. But you that tech, uh, so I would say maybe depending on the architecture, some architecture helps you perform uh, get better, to perform better and to perform better. Yes. So the architecture of a neural network does how neurons are connected together, in what layers and what's the connection between the neurons. That's like simply the architecture of a neural network. So let's so let's look at this architecture we have in mind here, which is this here. So if you look at this very first part, let's assume you have like your input here and you have you're expecting an output here. So what you have here, it's called like your input layer. And what you have at the very end is your output layer. So anything in between your input and your output layer is called like the hidden layer of your network. So just to recap, your neural network can be of any size and any varying connection. So where your data comes in to your neural network is known as the input layer. And what you're expecting to get at the end of like a sequence of layers or the last neurons or set of neurons of your neural network is called like the output layer. Anything in between is your hidden layer. So yes. Let me just check if there are any questions. Uh, can we have something like combination of both multi-class or multi-label? Uh, I honestly don't think so, because when you do multi-label, like it's mutually exclusive in that you could just have one label. So out of like several set of buckets, so your your when your model predicts, it just predicts only one value. But in multi-label, you could predict like your output can be in several buckets in this case. So that's what I would say. So it's mutually exclusive. You either have either multi-class or uh, multi-label, yes. So, yes. And uh, yeah. So I will just run this notebooks. So most of the things we have kind of seen before. So, but when we go deeper, I will explain more concepts as the come along. So concepts like uh, activation function, yeah, output activation, they're almost the same thing. So like we will see them in the next part of the notebook and I'll explain better in this part. So, yeah, so in this very first part, it's just more of like generating data sets that you could use for your classification. And in this notebook, what they did is just use, generate a data set that we could use for binary classifications. So it's a bit direct, so I won't maybe waste time in this. And so here there are more of like visualizing, just having some numbers just pop up on the screen. So as you can see in this like data set you have here, it's more of like your data and your label here is your your target, what you will be predicting or what you want the output of your model to be. As you can see, it has like two values, either one or zero. So which makes it uh, binary classifications. And yeah. So I'll just be running the notebook and I'll explain where it's necessary. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to just uh for any comments just feel free to unmute your mic or send uh send a message yeah.
So here in this value count, you want to see what's more of like the distribution of your targets. That's your uh, the ground truth of your Y. So here you could see like it's evenly balanced, which makes sense. So maybe later on, look at so in machine learning, you could find problems in which your data sets are not balanced and you kind of use techniques to make sure everything is balanced. So here you just kind of visualize the data set just so that you have a feel of your data set. And it could also give you intuition of how you could design your neural networks to make it, uh, yeah, to make the results really good. So here you could see like the data are a bit cycular in pattern, which are, you would see not linear. So you will like, if you do have experience building models, then you try, you start to have like intuition of what your model should be to get better performance. So it's always good to visualize. I will skip a number of parts and explain where it's, where it's necessary. Um, yes, something. Yes. So like we talked about in the first session with, uh, maybe PyTorch fundamentals in which you learn to work with uh, like PyTorch itself and manipulating tensors. So as you could see here, initially our data here is not in uh, tensor, PyTorch tensor. So what we did here is more of like moving our data from NumPy to a touch tensor so that we could easily manipulate and use to train our neural networks. So that's just what we did here. And then the next step is, okay, I think I missed some parts. Just one minute, okay. I think here it's complaining. We've got a tensor instead of uh, NumPy because we're expecting NumPy, but I think we could just uh, let it be. I'm guessing maybe I ran a, a cell before the other, so I think all good. So in this particular case, as I talked about, you're splitting your data into like train and test so that you could train on one particular data and also like test the performance on another data. And where it's more important is you building your model. So as we talked about, you could utilize any necessary compute you do have. So it's much more faster when you train on GPUs than compared to CPUs. So it's easy to, it's more better to create a like device agnostic code in which your device automatically runs if it, you just have a CPU. And when you have the benefit of having a GPU, your, your train also runs on GPU. So anyone could run your code easily. So in this particular cell, we are just trying to activate or set the device we do have for this particular so just so that we could also, we could move our tensors to, like later on we could move our tensors to either GPU or CPU. So, which I believe you have worked a lot in like your previous assessments using like moving across devices. So, yeah. So this is one of the most crucial parts when uh, developing neural networks or any particular model in PyTorch. That's where you define your model. And I will just go over it again. And let's see, because we've discussed a lot of things in the past. So I will like kind of go line by line and describe what we are trying to do in this particular sense. So first I will start with some high level like uh, descriptions. So when you look at this NN.model, so NN.model is more of like uh, PyTorch has this lab in which you could create neural networks. So NN.models, you try to adapt from NN.models because this method here, cycle model V0, is the name of your model. So what you are doing, you are more of like inheriting from NN.model. So PyTorch has this great lab for creating neural networks and you say, why not? I need this lab, but I have to do some modifications. So those modifications is what you do here and here because you want your model, you will have a particular uh, experiment you want to run and you want to run differently. So that's where you 
create your changes. So looking at those changes you are going to create, we will first look at this. So in this particular spot, what you are doing, you are more of like initializing what's existing in nn.model before you initialize what's next, what you would be needing for creating your neural networks. So as we said, uh, yes. So, so here I'll just maybe make a small visualization of neural network and explain to you how like the neural network on that I draw relates to what's in the code. I think to give you better uh, description of it. So like we said, imagine you have, let's say, So, uh, one minute, please. So, imagine you have a neural network with two imputes, with two imputes in the neural network, and it's you want it to output just one value. So I won't draw all the connections just so that it will be visible for you on the plot here. And we could just explain everything here. So everything about your neural network depends on the shape of your data. As we said, like for when you want to create a neural network, you have like the input layer, which is this in this case. You have the input layer and you have the output layer. So the structure or the design of your neural network depends on your data. So as we said, in the input layer, your data goes to the input layer and makes a prediction. So the number of neurons in your input layer should be equal to the number of features you have of your data. So as you could see, like the data we created here has has here, yeah, it has like two features and it predicts just kind of one output, one output. So it makes sense here to have like two inputs here and it predicts one value here, as we said in the output here. So that's how you design your neural network, depending on the inputs you have from your data. So that's like the input, the size of the input layer or the number of neurons from your input layer, then the values you want at the output, that's like the number of neurons you would put in or design for your uh, neural network. So please, if anything is not clear, just let me know and I will be happy to explain again. So, okay. Yeah, I have a question, please. Yes, please. Yeah, my question is that, uh... Is it from the data set? Can you be able to predict the numbers of layers uh, for a neural networks when it comes to like uh, forward propagations within the, the data set? Can you be able to determine how many layers are you going to make from the data set? Yeah. Is it possible? Not so, not so much. So one of the good advice may be like people say or from experience is, so one thing is, let's say you have, assuming I have this data set here, um, please, if it's not clear, just let me know. I have this, I'm considering having this table data set, right? Of maybe, let's see, feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four. Then it predicts, maybe this is my target. This is my prediction that I want. So I'm very sure it is, I would use all this input here. So that means my neural, the input of my neural network will have four layers. So I have maybe, uh, yes. So I have like one, two, three, four neurons at the very start. Then when you look at it, what's your, what's the output of your model? So assuming my model can predict, it's a multi-class classification, but can predict a range of, let's see, 
four values. Let's say maybe zero, one, three, four. It could be anything. It could be labels. It could be maybe, uh, maybe you have dog, cat, panda, and maybe chicken. Uh, okay. So you see, you your model is predicting for your data set consists of four labels. So in this case, your neural network, the output it will be also four in this case. So, but what happens in between? Oh, damn. So what happens, let's say you have four input neurons and you have, let's say four outputs. So what happens in this space is defined by you as the deep learning engineer in this case. So one of the advice you mostly will be given, start with very small neural networks and see how it works. If you start with very small neural networks and it gives you a good result that you are satisfied with, then you're good. Because the larger the neural network, the more likely you would, uh, the model, your model will overfit, so which you don't want. So start with very small size neurons, then move after, move, uh, if it doesn't give you considerable results, then you could try to increase along the way. So, yes. But I don't know, maybe if that answers your question, please. Yeah, sure. There's no problem. Thank you. Okay, nice. So I think there's a similar question by Farida. How, how do you determine your hidden layer size? So your hidden layer size is what they call like hyperparameters. You've maybe come across hyperparameters when you are dealing with machine learning. So maybe I'll just give a small. So you remember, yes. So uh, your hidden layer, it can be anything. So it's what you define yourself. So it's a hyperparameter. It's what you select as like deep learning engineer. So it could be anything. So you just experiment with different values and you kind of get intuition like, if I have more neural network hidden layers, it will work better. If I have more neural uh, hidden layer neurons, so it will work better. So like hyperparameters is what you as the deep learning developer set for your model. Then when you say parameters, parameters is what your model learn internally. So you remember we said like for your linear, yes, it could be any number, yes. So yeah, yeah it could be any number. And uh, yes, so just to explain, yes. So here, what you are doing is you are more of, in this particular part here, so what you are doing is uh, you are saying like, you are defining your layers and you could read it as, for your layer one here, you are saying you have input features two and output features five. <clears throat> so what you are saying is, you have two neurons at the very start, and you're expecting to map to maybe five outputs here. Yeah. So that's what you are saying at the very start here. So you are expecting to map to like five different neurons. So there are more connections, but here I'm just simplifying it. That's like for the first layer. So here and in layer two here, what you are telling it, it has, it, you are expecting to take in five features and you are expecting to have one output. So you are expecting this five here and you are expecting to have one neuron at the output. So be very mindful because here at this point, you just make definitions, more of like you just define like the tools you need to create your neural network. So where you define like the interactions of like the layers or like how the process will come about is in this forward uh, method here. So in this forward method, you kind of uh, describe like the relationship or how your data flows through your neural network. So I would just cancel and yes. So like we said here, uh yes so so here we have our let's say layer one here we have your layer two so 
what we are going to do is look at like the forward function here. So what can you see in the forward function? You have, uh, yes. Okay, there's a question for Abdullahi. So I will answer in just a minute. So what you have here, you have your layer one, but I think what you should look at is what is in your forward uh, method here. So you have X here. So what is X here? X here is like set of like data points coming into your model. So what you are saying is you want every input of your data X here to go in first into layer one here. So what is your layer one? So this is your layer one here. So here you are saying like you have input and you have, you need two inputs here. You have input one and input two to go into your neural network. So what happens next? So the output of your layer one also go further goes into layer two. So you are telling it, you are telling your neural network how you want your connection between your layers to be. So this is a very simple, uh, maybe very simple neural network but it should, it can go beyond this in which you could have several connections going together and you have several complex comp uh, connections just to define what you have in mind. So be rest assured like all these connections is defined by you, the deep learning engineer. So when you have better experience, you try to understand which connections might be better and you experiment and yes, so nothing is defined at first. So I think what next you want it is from your layer one to be connected to layer two in this particular sense. So here you have, we could say you have like your neural network connections. So just to recap in the very first sense that's in here, in this initialization, just take it like you try to initialize the tools you need to build your neural network, this could be your your layers it could also be uh what's the name it could also be your activation functions then finally in forward here as we said in previous lectures you define like your data flow how each layer is connected to each other and how they should move along each other so i think uh, in the next cells we will explain why you should be careful with this uh definitions, that's when you define layers, one layer going to the next subsequent layer. So it should have the same input and output features just so that it will match each other. Because when you look at it here, here we are defining, so I could just easily say, yeah, in your layer one, you want it to have five output features. So simply you are just saying to have like five outputs. It should have an input of two and an output of five. So in your layer two, you are also telling it input features of five and output of one. So these two things here should also, if you kind of know it, they are connecting to each other. So it's more of like a switch or something or of like a plug. So they should fit into each other. So you should have the same number of the layers, output layers of the first layer should coincide, coincide with the input layer of the next layer. So that is, but I think in the next cells, you'll see why this is important also. So there are a few questions. I'll just look at them, then maybe try to briefly talk about them. So, uh, yes. So, so there's a question for Abdullahi. Can I call the number of node in the hidden layer hyperparameters? Yes, exactly. So uh, I'll just explain what's the difference between hyperparameters and parameters just so that you could easily uh, understand it in the future. So let's say, assuming I have maybe a neural network. So as you could see here, like I'm defining everything in my network here. So I define the connections and I, yeah, I could just leave some things out here. So I could say this is the output here and this is the input here. So any, as you could see, I personally define this. I define this connection here. I defined, let's say the number of neurons here. So I, I defined it as four here. So anything you define as a deep learning engineer, that's what you call hyperparameters. So it doesn't matter what it is. It could be your type of optimizer, your 
your activation functions, the number of neurons, the number of layers of your neural network. So it's hyperparameter. But what your model learns internally by looking at your data and maybe performing any learning mechanism. So that's what you term as parameters. So like you could look at it simply in the case of where you have a one new where you have a one layer neural network where you have your uh, data coming in here and you have the output here. So this is like a very simple linear regression. You have your MX plus B. So you know when you pass in your data into this, your model learns what's the value of M here. Your model learns what's the value of the bias here that could that could be very close to your output as much as possible. So this is your parameter one. This is your parameter maybe two. So anything your model learns in this case is your parameter. So, but anything that is subject from your own maybe thinking, so it's hyperparameter. So yeah. And uh, yes. So if there's any questions, so I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, I don't think we have uh, much time, so I'll just try to. I have a little question before you. Go. Yes, please. Okay, my question is that is it advisable for somebody to uh, draw a scheme of his neural network before implementation by looking at the uh, data? Set? I think it depends, but but not so much, I would say, because you could start with small neurons. So if you have a very small data set, maybe that has two features, so you could maybe easily sketch it just so that you could have some visualization, but there are tools that could help you visualize your neural network in which you would see maybe some of them. And yeah, there are tools that have been built to help you visualize your neural network and to visualize their training uh, mechanism. And you could also like inspect if your neurons are training, maybe the way you expect, or there are some neurons that are active within your training process. Maybe for small neurons, you could maybe try doing some computations by hand, but when you try to do very large neural network, it becomes complicated for you. So it's easier to just maybe go with the flow. Uh, since you have a sense of how small neurons work and you could maybe imagine how large neurons too will work. Yeah. So, so most of what we explained would largely be in this particular part. And like I just described, you have this playground TensorFlow so here you could work with or play around with a few data sets and you will also see, you could change some neuron connections and try to train them. So it will be very good starting point to just play around things and see how like a small neural network uh, works and uh, maybe some training mechanisms here. So yeah. So here I will just go over another kind of uh, technique. So here, so like I said in PyTorch makes things easier for you so that you don't start from scratch. So imagine like the neural network we built here. So you could easily, like everything we did here, you could easily do that using nn.sequential. So nn.sequential, what it does is more of like, it's basically the same thing. It creates a neural network for you and it just stacks them together, which is good. But okay, let me just, so it stacks them together. So just exactly what we explained here, you have two input neurons and you have maybe five uh, hidden neuron, one hidden layer with five neuron, then you have one output. So it's exactly like we explained. So sequential, it's, it is good because it's easy. It makes like you implementing it very easy, but it's not, it's not what you always use. And then dot sequential here, it's good like when your layers are stuck together, but when you have a very more complicated neural network, so you will always have to revert to this. So what is maybe a complicated neural network? So you could think of a neural network that is not of this particular convention. And that's where like definition of architecture comes in. So I could have a neural network of still two inputs. I would say, okay. Let's say similar neural network as this. I have two input, I have, yeah, similar, but the connections are different. 
So I could have this connecting to this, this connecting to this, and yeah, maybe connecting to everything. And also have some special connections from the input. I kind of want it to map to the output here. So it just depends on what you want. So in this special case, NN dot sequential doesn't do the job for you because it just follows like a standard template. So you need to like revert to the other one. But if you have something, so you could, if you are, are dealing with a very large neural network and some part of the layers are maybe sequential, you could maybe just have some, how would I say? Maybe some package set of neural networks that have NN dot sequential, and you could uh, yeah you could experiment with different things. So what I'm saying in essence is NN dot sequential is when you have like sequential layers, but anything that extends beyond your normal neural network that has like some complex uh, configurations. So you have to revert back. So you remember how we talked about forward module. So how it uh, how it defines like your connection between your neural networks. So you have to go back to there. So I think I'll just check if there's any questions and move very fast. Mm. Okay, no questions. So, so I'll just try to move. So here it's more of like predicting. So if you remember back, we have defined our neural network. So now we will try to define our loss function and optimizer. So remember what we said about loss functions. A loss function, you are just trying to uh, define like how close is your model to uh, the predictions of your model to like the ground truth that you have from your data. So that's why it's good from your loss function. And using your loss function, you could perform gradient descent from that. So, so that's like for the loss. And you have also optimizer. So primarily here, there are maybe two optimizers, which is stochastic gradient descent and Adam. So hopefully maybe tomorrow in the discussion, we will, because there was a question previously about like the difference, why it works well. So hopefully tomorrow we'll have like an in-depth look at both of them and explain maybe their training mechanism. So, and there are a number of loss functions. So previously we only talked about this mean absolute error and uh mean squared error which are good especially if you are dealing with regression problems but when you try to deal with classification problems so these are maybe the new loss you could look at binary cross entropy loss and cross entropy loss binary cross entropy loss it just checks it also checks like a distance between your model prediction and what you have in your ground truth, but use like different kind of mechanism for making those computations. So when you deal with multi-class classification, that's where you would have to use uh, cross entropy loss. But these are like a few out of like several loss you could use for uh, classification. So there are a number of other uh, different losses you could use. So, so like always, yeah, uh, like documentations on this, and yeah, so one minute, let me just check. So I think one, what would be good to discuss, I think before the end is activation functions, but we will just like, uh, I'll just skim a bit. Let me just try to run this cells. So here you are defining your loss functions and your optimizer. So your loss is more of like defines the distance between your predi model prediction and your model, the ground truth of your model. Optimizer how you would perform gradient descent of your model. So after your model kind of lens using this, like uh, the loss function and the optimizer. So it's always good to have something to evaluate your model with. So it's something similar to the loss, but a bit different. So you have accuracy, which is good. So you could remember back our data set is balanced. So accuracy, it's a reasonable matrix. But when your data set is not balanced, that's you would try to look at other metrics which you would use to evaluate how well your model is training. So, so uh, having all this in place, what you would do next is more of like training the models. So here, okay, one minute, let me see. So, okay, just one minute. Okay, so here I will just explain why 
what is logit and why we need to use sigmoid here. So when when you have your model here, let's say you have a model that does predictions here, and you have some kind of connection between your model. So you're expecting your model to make some predictions for your output. So the prediction your model makes here, it's you could say might be a very large range of maybe values. Maybe you could say something between maybe negative infinity, like very large values. So, but what do you want? It doesn't really give you, this is a classification problem. And in that sense, you want your model to classify maybe between one of two values. So it could be maybe dog and cat for in this case, or you could just assign like some numeric labels of zero or one. So you need to convert like this negative infinity to a value of zero to one. So I think that's where things like activation functions come into play. So I will explain activation functions because I believe subsequently it's very important to learn uh, activation because you will see it later part of the notebooks. So maybe with that, I will just accept any questions before we close for the day because that's the most important part. So any issues you have later on, just please let me know in tomorrow's class, then we'll do kind of revision. So what are activation functions? And uh, when you look, so you have like activation functions here. So when, if you remember what we said about like each neuron of your neural network, so each neuron of your neural network represents like some value mx plus b here. As we said, this is this is linear, but like with most data you will come across are not linear. So linear means like your data, uh, your data or anything or your function has like a straight line. But it's possible the function you might be considering is not linear in some sense. So how can you? how can you like insert the concept of non-linearity into your model? So that's where like activation functions come into play. So it just gives your, your model a sense of non-linearity. So there are several activation functions. So first, more importantly, so we'll look at how to convert like a very large range of values from zero to one. So you want to kind of squish in like very large values to be in the range of zero to one. So one of those, so um, okay, but I just want to clear this drum. Just one minute, please. Yes. So, so let's say you still considering like the model you had, which is like predicting one value. Like we said, the output here would be like really large, which would be a range of values from like any range of values. But what you actually want is for it to be between maybe zero and one, because when you look at it, you are trying to have, you have like an output of one. So let's say you are predicting between a dog or a cat. So you want it to have, like something like a probability distribution. So like what's the probability it's a dog or what's the probability that it's a cat? For instance, let's say 0 0.98% versus maybe 0.02%. When you have a high probability, it means it's a, a dog. When you have a low probability, it means it's a cat. So here you want, how could like this very large values here translate to 
like the values between zero to one, you know, like the concept from probability where, where you have a probability of zero, it means like it will not happen by any chance. Then when you have a probability of one, you have a very high chance or you are certain that like, this would happen. So you want to like squish very, these very large values between zero to one. So one of the primary uh, activations function you could use is what we have here, sigmoid here. So what it does here, maybe I won't go deep into like the formula. So the formula is just maybe this. Uh, yes, minus X here. Yeah. So in any sense, so for any input, let me see. Uh, So like this is in your y axis, this is one. Then like at the very least point, this is zero here. So the values, it, it transforms any set of values between like zero or one, which is like the probability distribution you need. So that's why it's when your model predicts, if you are dealing with binary classification, you want to get some probability, a kind of probability distribution of how well your prediction is. So that's why you use sigmoid in some particular case. And it's also a very good interview question because they usually ask it. So for multi-class classification, you use a different activation functions. So which is softmax. So softmax it in sigmoid, you only use it when you have like binary classification, but for multi-class classification, you use softmax. Softmax considers like several classes and performs, calculates the probability for them. So yeah. So if you have any questions, please uh, do ask and so yeah. So binary classification, it's what is binary classification weight? I don't think there is binary classification weight for me. There is um, okay, there's binary classification with logits. So if you understand like the explanation we made for so if you understand like the explanation we made for sigmoid, so sigmoid you want your output to have like any output from your neural network to have like some values for of zero to one. So the two difference there are like two maybe sigmoid implementations in PyTorch. There is binary uh cross entropy with sigmoid loss so in this case it includes like your sigmoid in like all this function so what it is is you could look at it like you have your binary cross entropy plus sigmoid so it performs like both your binary classification or sigmoid so here there is like some discussions in which to re use to which to use in each particular case or which is more important than the other and uh, maybe you could also have a read at that and see how it goes. I don't think we have much time. I'll just look at maybe any additional important concepts and try to explain them. So, or maybe I would in the final, yes. So here, finally you have like your training loop in which you have everything in place and your model trains. So it's nice because we've already covered what's the essence of training loop. If you don't understand, please revert back. So the most important part is looking at how you define your model in which we explain. So your model trains as we described in the previous lecture and tries to learn the best parameters in which it could predict effectively. So and next you try to perform some predictions and evaluate how well your model is. So as you could see here, like the model doesn't really perform well. It tries to predict just a straight line, but that's not the case because your data is really complicated. The straight line, no matter the amount of, or no matter, let's say the direction of the straight line, it won't be able to give you a good kind of classifications. So that's where it's good now to look at non-linearity. And like we said, how could you include non-linearity into your model? That's where you need to look at uh, activation functions. So sorry, we'll just maybe spend five additional minutes and maybe I'll explain more into activation functions 
and so that you will just have so that it will be easy for you when maybe doing the exercises or looking at this notebook. So in general, there are several ways you could improve your neural networks when training. So one of the ways is maybe to add more layers. So adding more layers, it's more of like putting in more hidden neurons. So like you ask several questions on what's the optimum size of the hidden layer. So it mostly doesn't depend on your data. So you experiment, the plan is lots of experimentation. You start with small size new uh, layers and you also experiment with the number of neurons. That's maybe where you add your maybe output features to be more than maybe you did an experiment where your output features was for one layer was five. We experiment to more uh, output uh, layers, which is more neurons. So you could also try to train for longer. So it's also possible that your model is not converging. So by training longer, it it's possible for your your model to learn like the optimum uh, parameters to uh, predict well. But also try to monitor your training logs and more of like your visualizations from your training. As we said in the previous lecture, visualizations are very important because you could see trends that your model might be overfitting. And when you keep training, it just becomes worse than before. So having a view of this particular visualizations will be very helpful. So learning rate, we have gone on learning rate. We've talked about it. Having low learning rates might a bit lead to maybe, uh, what's the name? Yeah, having low learning rates might maybe take time for your model to learn, but also it's good so that it doesn't overshoot like your optimal, your local, your global uh, minimum of loss. So, but when you have very large learning rates, your model can just maybe dance around and not learn what is good. So like there is also transfer learning, which we'll look at in some couple of sections. So the idea between transfer of transfer learning, it's where you have an already pre-built model and what you just have to do, so from that pre-built model, it has learned how to extract some uh, features from like the data sets. So looking at the example of image classification or any image related tax. So when you have a pre-trained model, so it has, so in the initial set of training, it has learned how to extract important features. So why this makes it easy for you, you don't need to go through all that process of it learning how to extract features because it has learned that. So what you just have to do is just fine tune to like a particular streamlined tax you want. So, and it's like easier for you to train your models on that. So, uh, yes. So I think just briefly, I would explain some concepts of, uh, um, uh, Yes, so I'll explain some concepts of activation function. So like we said, you have activation functions so that it will kind of increase the nonlinearity of your model. So there are several activation functions you have. So one of which is ReLU and ReLU also have several kind of derivatives, which are a bit different. So what is ReLU? ReLU it's an, okay, yes. So what is ReLU? So remember we said when you have linear models, so it's just a straight line, but when you have, but in the real world, like the functions you want your model to learn might be a bit tricky in some sense. So, but when you look at it with neural networks, you could learn to, you could learn this nonlinearity by, uh, by adding, uh, by adding activation functions. So with ReLU, we spoke initially about sigmoid. So it really what it does is for any input. So this is more of like, so when you look at it here, let's assume this is your X and this is your Y. So for any input, it's more of like for any input of, let's see one here, the output is one. For any input of X here, the output is X. But if it's lower than zero, if it's less than zero, so it, it gives it a value of zero. So it just maybe shuts down everything below zero. So that's uh, how REL works. 
So it's very good because of this linearity, because when you look at this slope here of any function here, it consists of maybe several, maybe small, arguably maybe small lines. So, so when your model learns these small lines, so it learns to maybe predict very effectively. So Red who kind of helps uh, bring that initiative. So it's really good. So just to give some recap of maybe history. So initially, like how your brain works is more of like on and off, like sigmoid. So initially, when you train neural networks, people use sigmoid, thinking like since your brain could work well with sigmoid, so why not this neural network? But they came to find out uh, with ReLU, ReLU was actually better, even though that's not what we humans use. So try to always experiment with things and uh, see how it goes, inshallah. So I think with this, I'll just check if there are any questions. And if you do have, you could unmute your mic or ask, or ask in the chat. So there is a question for Abdullah, what's the difference between activation functions and optimizers? So I'll just answer it briefly before we close for the day. And yeah, so with activation functions, so uh, with activation functions, it's more of activation functions serve like some, sometimes it could be a filter and sometimes it could just be to constrain your output to some particular values. So activation functions simply is just to put non-linearity -linear, into your neural networks because like each neuron works like a straight line, but in some sense, your what you want to model or the model you want to learn from your data is not mostly straight lines. So you could have some kind of surfaces. So with activation functions, it's help you learn like those surfaces that your model wants to uh, your model wants to learn. So with optimization, optimization helps you when learning through back propagation. So optimizers. So optimizers tell your when you try to do back propagation, it tells your model how to take a step in the right direction during back propagation. So yes, so I think that's uh, majorly it. Yes. So opti uh, optimizers it just helps during back propagation. How should your model get like the to minimize its loss. So activation function just deals with the structure of your model, just putting non-linearity into your model here. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think we have, let me just check if there's anything in the chat. So, but if there's anything you understand, please feel free to talk on the chat. And tomorrow, hopefully we'll have a session in which we'll just, uh, we will talk about some concepts. Uh, yeah, so sorry, we have extended beyond time really, Thank you for your time. And if there's anything, just let me know. And uh, yeah, it was nice meeting you this weekend. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So much. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. And yeah, just make sure to do the exercises, please. Don't forget. So there will be no advanced exercises. Just do the any exercise in the notebook. So yeah. Thank you, sir. Ah uh, no 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 problem thank you. Okay, so bye. See you tomorrow, inshallah.